I love the smell of my pump in the morning. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Hello, and welcome to As Depicted on Film. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, the fresh water system of public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Hi, everybody, this is Gil. Let's talk House of the Dragon Episode 2, The Rogue Prince. Wow, this prince is indeed gone rogue. I was shocked by the dragon scene. I mean, that took some real suspension of disbelief. I mean, the dragon part, that, that looked cool. I'm talking about the egg. You know, dragons, that's basically like nukes, right? So the eggs, that's basically nuclear material. So this former heir, former heir, you know, left office, went back after he lost his bid to stay the heir. And he takes with him the most sensitive, the most sensitive nuclear material, a dragon egg. I mean, that was preposterous, preposterous. Really took me out of the scene. I was really feeling the dragons, you know. And then this ridiculous thing, you know, a top level official taking with him nuclear, nuclear material. Just like, you know, he holds it just like that, you know, no real security. Ugh. That was really lame. But other than that, the episode was pretty good. So let's talk about the episode. For, first of all, it started and ended uh, Better Call Saul style. This gives the inevitability, prequely feel to it. It starts at the beach with a scene that is actually at the end. Okay, so that's like to give you the sense that the events <laughs> that are going to come, the civil war, the destruction, the end of the world is inevitable. Inevitable. So the twists and turns are not meant to be surprising. It's more how. It is done. So for me, the episode was about three things. First, about the order of things. Another way to say the status quo. It was about how all politics is personal, deeply personal. And again, this sense of how the characters are trapped in their world, in their period in time. King Viserys' decision to marry, to marry someone else was inevitable because we know what happened. There was no other way it could be. This is the time that they've been given. Okay, so let's start with the order of things, the status quo. So the person who uses that phrase, you know, she's a woman. So for her, the order of things is that she didn't get to be queen. Oh, oh, poor rich billionaire princess, heiress, former heiress. Oh, she doesn't get to be queen. Wow, that's that must be tough. And there are a lot of like really, really, you know, sad elites there. Really, uh, ruling is so hard, you know, making these decisions. Should I pimp my daughter to the king while he's grieving? Or should I tend to the needs of the people? Hmm. Very, very hard decisions to make. <laughs> so I want to say this to Renira, the queen who never was. I don't care that you didn't get to be queen, even though it was your turn. This is not the actual struggle here between female and male billionaires and rulers and aristocrats talking about a queen they say to the king oh a queen will bring comfort to the subject to the subjects <laughs> you know what will give comfort to the subjects i don't know maybe if you shaped policies that benefits the subjects did any of you think about that <laughs> so all these politicians Basically, they're all politicians, whether they have an official job or not. They're fighting among themselves, but they're part of the exact same clique. 
And this is never more apparent than at the end of the episode when Damon uh, speaks with, uh, with the head of House Valeria, the House Valerian. And when he says uh, about the king, oh, he has balls and feasts, <laughs> the prince is like, hey, 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 don't do that. If you do that to my brother, you'll be able to do that to me. No, 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 no. There's an order of things here. I'm a Targaryen, a royal, my brother too, and you are not. We're all part of the same clique and club, but I'm in a sub-club that is above yours, okay? And he didn't say a word, because he likes the order of things. He gets to be number two. And maybe if he plays his cards right, he gets to be number one or his descendants gets to be number one. And this gets me to the politics is personal thing. I thought this episode had a lot of uh, pre-Roman Civil War vibes to it. How ambition is the most dangerous thing in the world. Competition between ambitious people is like a nuclear device. Their ambition to fulfill some grandiose image of themselves, that is what drives them to act. Then, now, all the time. <laughs> I don't want ambitious representatives. No, I want representatives who look to pass good policies that will benefit people. If your preferred politician is ambitious, if that's something that you see about that politician, then I think that's one strike against them. This was exactly the formula for the Roman civil wars. Once all the outside enemies were done with, all this insane competition and ambition in the DNA of their culture, made them turn their lances and legions, and here it's the dragons, against each other. When getting the top job doesn't make you a chieftain, a lord, a prince, but the king, there are no higher stakes than that, then it will attract the worst kinds of people, the most ambitious kinds of people. Another Roman aspect is this is basically like a soap opera. This uh, cousin and another uncle, and I marry your daughter, and you want me to marry that daughter. This reminds me of uh, the book and show I, Claudius. At this period, this actual historical period in time where everybody was somebody's cousin and everybody was angling to get a better seat at the court because now the top person in Rome, he's, you know, wasn't officially the emperor then, but de facto it was an emperor of the known world. And when ambitious people don't get everything that they wish, oh, they get hurt really quickly. Oh, they were passed over. Oh, this was taken from me. I'm owed this. I didn't lose. I didn't lose. No, no, I didn't lose. Let me take some nuclear material back home. The second sons that were passed over. Oh, this is so sad. This is really tragic. You can really feel for those people. One last thing about how politics is personal. The king doesn't do anything about his brother. He doesn't stand up to bullying. Because if politics is personal, it means that he's very, very human. When you have a bully, stand up to him at the beginning. If you see a rogue faction in your country openly talking about a civil war, <laughs> it is better the civil war comes earlier than later when they are better ready. But he doesn't want to do anything until he learns that his uh, son's egg is there. Ah. Then he sends this uh, FBI, not even raid, they come and ask politely, please, give us the egg, and you gotta hand it to Damien. They came over, the first time, asked him, made a little fuss, 
but he gave the nuclear material right away. All of it. He didn't have a few more eggs <laughs> over there. So, I don't know. Good on you, Damon. So, for me, this, this entire show, you know, two episodes, feels like watching an accident in slow motion. We know that everything is going to go so horribly wrong, and it goes wrong pretty quickly. And it's going to be a very, very different kind of emotional ride. I hope it manages to sustain its energy. I thought the first episode was better than this episode. Or maybe I'm just a little bit medievaled out. I don't know. Like, like so much of the historical uh, fiction is set in European medieval times as if that's the most or the only interesting period in the world. Okay, so this is it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out my two podcasts, a podcast of biblical proportions and as depicted on film. I'm Gil Kidron. I'll see you next week.